Yeah, finally, I hit the button. <laughs> yeah, apprehensive. Uh, it's one of those days. Celebrating figments of people's imagination. Uh, just kind of just grinds it right into your face that people are just too stupid. So what am I talking to them for? I really don't have a choice. Uh, but anyway, I'll endeavor to persevere and uh, such. So before we get to the video, uh, just a little added value. Um, um, just to make sure it's all understood that this is the context. So they have made no effort to come up with any other explanation but their wavical force field these whatever stuff. Now even though photons have every appearance of being something we'd call a force, they keep wanting to make it into something different. They want to make forces into something different. They want to make them into yeah, there's some kind of field, you know, that already is there, and that somehow something goes through the field and somehow makes the field do something a little different. Instead of just saying, there's a something, okay, and then there's nothing. And there's little somethings make the field. The soldiers make the big pile of army men, you know. Uh, so the field doesn't exist until you have the stuff to make it out of. Um, it's not a pre-existing condition. Uh, but anyway, they don't even consider the possibility, uh, realistically. All right, so there's a couple of little things. I guess the first thing would be to understand that this photon thing is a little bit like, uh, in my youth, I did play with what were called uh, ultrasonic uh, transducers. And it's just really a crystal of quartz or something like that. Um, you know, with a wire connected to it, <clears throat> and basically uh, you could vibrate it. And if you vibrated it, it would, you know, bend it. It would create a little tiny current from the pressure of the vibration. So sound could vibrate it, but it didn't vibrate it enough. So, but the higher the frequency, the more likely it was to vibrate um, to a certain limit, because it's a big hunk of crystal. It'd be like a centimeter. Um, square. Uh, so light didn't affect it. But, you know, a certain range of radio frequencies would, uh, you know, our frequencies, um, Hertzian frequencies, would vibrate it. Um, so you could use it like you use light sensors or something else. You could send a whole bunch of this stuff out by putting a current in. You could vibrate it, send a signal out, and then receive it with another crystal. And, um, <clears throat> well, anyway, so that idea works, and obviously that idea is, <clears throat> you know, collecting stuff over the entire surface of the crystal to vibrate it. And I would kind of argue that light's doing something um, similar. Uh, it has a similar capacity uh, with certain matter <clears throat> to create areas, you know, trampolines, if you wish. Um, you know, places for the light to hit. So it light hits the surface, and the little bits hit the surface at different locations, and obviously at a specific frequency also. <clears throat> and they vibrate the surface. They uh, impose upon the electrons, push them in a direction, give them momentum, and essentially they give back that momentum. They want to return to their normal state, and when they when they give it back, when they go the opposite direction, they leave behind the direction they're changing. And so they send essentially the same signal that came in, they send to another layer of the substance. And eventually you get to the other surface, and the other surface will do essentially the same thing. The electrons will pop out a little bit. And then when they go back in, all right, that's when they'll re release this pattern. So pattern comes in, pattern comes out, would be the theory of something transparent. So this is just real stuff. It has to be collected over a series of atoms. So one photon isn't going to be seen by one electron. So again, let's get the size thing right. You know, the electron is this little thing, and the frequency of the light, that is the polarization of the light, is huge by comparison. I mean, not 
this, but like this times, uh, let's just say 10,000, you know, for fun. So this thing is huge. So it can't be interacting with one photon. I mean, the wave would be, you know, this is just a, you know, I'm exaggerating. I mean, I'm under showing. See, they kind of think this wave somehow interacts with this photon and somehow, I mean, this, this electron, and that somehow this electron feels the field change this makes and that somehow it stops this thing from going okay the wave doesn't just continue somehow the wave hits this thing and all of this somehow gets absorbed okay by this electron in some manner which seems implausible um, uh, the electron has a motion of some kind and then decides at some future location to readmit something waving yeah, you know, and it just there's just no way to make any sense out of it, uh, in my opinion. Uh, it's nearly catastrophically flawed as an idea, <laughs> if not catastrophically flawed. It's so close to it that it's the same thing. <clears throat> but they won't even have the discussion or the argument or anything. They'll just tell you the dogma. The Jesus is real, and we must celebrate his birthday. Uh, let's not celebrate something. I mean, let's not celebrate an actual, actual accomplishment of any human being on Earth today. Let's, you know, celebrate a fable. Um, but anyway, <sighs> continuing. Um, so uh, this is something that happens, you know, with atoms and with pieces of a photon. A photon isn't some generic thing. So again, when he's talking about photon, he's often one minute he'll be talking about the stream of a photon, which is this entire combined effort. And the next minute, photon means this one element has a certain amount of energy, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't deal with length or amount. He just deals with the fact that your eye needs a certain number of these things to hit to say photon. Now, if 12 hits or 15 hits or, you know, that's the same as 9, okay? Uh, more than enough. So it's really just about what's enough. It's not about a specific amount. And um, when it comes to frequency, it's the same sort of argument. The, it's not about, in most cases, being a specific frequency. It's just about being fast enough to uh, cause it something to tip. Uh, in a way that <clears throat> will make a difference. And so I was contemplating, you know, because this is an interaction with matter, not an interaction with uh, individual electrons, um, that uh, the, the hydrogen atom, you could, so I try to, let's draw these as the protons. Um, they're not found in nature as isolated things. So uh, there's no hydrogen that's always in this kind of form, like two uh, atoms of hydrogen combined. Um, and so I thought, oh, I said, oh, that's certainly interesting. And this is true of oxygen and a lot of other things. They're really not found as individual atoms. They're always found as uh, more than one, two or more. Um, so the trick here would be by, you know, my theory, that you could take these you know, the hydrogen 2 or the hydrogen in its natural state. And you can understand it as being really just two neutrons. You know, and so when they say that atoms are made out of protons and electrons, you could argue that, no, they're really made out of neutrons. And it's just how the neutrons are f arranged to each other. Yes, the protons are essential, but the protons are part of a neutron. So you can say that hydrogen is basically two neutron, two neutrons. You know, and it works, it comes out to the right math. Um, and once you do that, you get this idea that if I'm arguing that there's a, a force that's the same as the electron, so if there's an electron force and an electron, two plus two plus two physics. So there's two kinds of force there's proton force and then there's electron force, and they inversely operate. So uh, this would be drawn the other way. Um, these would uh, be attraction between these two, and there would be repulsion. Um, so I'm really drawing this wrong because it's not the yellow force. 
Uh, but anyway, I guess I should have used some other color. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. Probably doesn't matter. Well, anyway, the point would be is that the protons can get very close to each other because all the stuff that's yellow goes out of the electron either way. And all the stuff that's, <clears throat> you know, yes, and all the, all the stuff that's blue between them would also just go out the protons. So you can't keep any force between them, therefore they can get very close together. Now the electrons have essentially photons going back and forth. And there's sort of an absence between these two because any blue force goes out of the proton and any yellow force goes out of the electron. So there's low pressure between the electron and the proton and there's high pressure between the electrons because there's nothing to let the force out. And so when you're making a photon, the idea might be as simple as you're hitting the electron and each hit causes a little bit of motion so you move it a little bit. Well a little bit's not going to change anything here it's just going to move right back but if you hit it in sequence before it can rebound with energy you will move the electron to a new position and that will release the pressure between these electrons that will escape the electron will end up moving uh, closer because there's less pressure pushing it away. You can see that if I did this with magnets, okay, that this was a south magnets and this was north magnets, you could sort of understand, you know, in principle, how there would be repulsion between the northers and repulsion between the southerns and that this would all be a balance, that you could theoretically keep something in this position. And if I could actually regulate how strong the magnet is, that how, how much pressure was actually between the magnets, that um, you know I could change its position. Uh, there would be, if there's less repulsion, then the thing would move down. And if there's, somehow, if I put more pressure in here, then it would move up. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can just understand that this is a, a machine that can create these effects that you know are so common um, in electromagnetism and that this design works um, you can understand how things could attach to this mechanism it's got this free electron just sitting here um, and that you can make a uh, you know you don't need all this swirly stuff all the rest of it this is an alternative model that could work and they haven't even considered it it's not even part of their imagination they have not even contemplated any of these uh, alternative stories. Uh, and that was a critical error made by physics, in my opinion, because they've stuck themselves to a old archaic, you know, fable, um, <clears throat> you know, in, invented in a period where people didn't have as many facts as they have now. Uh, and... Uh, they keep just clinging to it as this is the truth this is the truth and it's a big mistake so I could do a bit about uh, scatter I mean it'll come up in other videos in the future yeah so I'll wait till then um, but then you get into the whole phase thing breaking these you know as I've sort of pointed out it's kind of easy to understand that if I you know send energy uh, you know that has some variety in its location spatially it has the right frequency and but spatially the bits are in different locations that it would be fairly easy for something to hit a molecule have its phase changed all right so its position is moved you know this thing is moved to this position so, so you could say it's in the same place in space but it's in a new position and now the frequency is gone the energy is still there, the capacity to be a photon is still there, but now their little bits are out of phase. And that all you need to do is do the same thing you did to this one, to this one, and this one, and you'll at least have three of these things back again. Uh, you know, and you can register a photon in certain circumstances with those elements returned. So, um, you know, that's... Uh, perfectly 
a reasonable explanation of polarization and why phase is fundamentally the cause of the um, things we call uh, interference. Uh, it's not really interference, it's just breaking and then remaking. Perfectly viable explanation and not even considered, not even thought about. Um, because they're just focused on making their Jesus story uh, the truth and finding every excuse to say, yes, it's true. Uh, you know, there's Mary on uh, the picture of Mary on somebody's toast. Uh, you know, it must be true. You know, uh, it, it's, they're just doing exactly what religious people do. Uh, which, I mean, it's not religious people. They're doing exactly what humans do, which is fall for it. Um, you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time. Blah, blah, blah. It's just a tragic, sad, pitiful truth. So, to the video. And in our quest to understand the photon, now let's we go missed look at all the fun one part. of the most... Uh, welcome to my welcome to electron drawing. line, and in our quest to understand the photon, now let's go look at one of the most famous experiments done, not only because the result experiment was so enormously important, but also who did the experiment. It was, it was uh, Einstein, and Einstein received the Nobel Prize for this particular experiment. It was called the photoelectric effect. So, again, this is another one of these things that's a little tainted as stories, just because you know, lots of people were playing with the core effect. And it's just spelling it out again, you know, taking what, you know, so you can almost say it's like the Maxwell thing, just taking other people's work and remolding it into some <clears throat> more clear definition. And it reveals an enormous amount about the photon. It turns out that that is exactly why Einstein received the Nobel Prize, because he actually proved in his experiment that photons were quantized pieces of energy. So, so I'd say the irony of this is, as much as I like the idea, you know, as much as I'm for people understanding that it can be understood as clumps of energy, I really want people to understand you can do it that way. This is a poor example um, in the sense that you're still stuck with the fact that we can only detect things as clumps. This experiment pretty much points out that we only can see clumps. It doesn't really point out that the stuff is clumps. It just points out that we only see things in <clears throat> that we need nine of them or we need six of them. Or we need a certain amount of them in a certain arrangement to say we see it. But again, we're not seeing the individual clumps. We're seeing the fact that you can create electricity or you can create a certain effect by hitting that piece of crystal the right way. You hit it the wrong way, no effect. You hit the right way, you get an effect. And that's all this sort of proves is that there's a certain resident narrowness, uh, a certain um, uh, complementary to the circumstance of the matter will force it to be in a certain configuration to be able to affect the matter in a certain way. You have to hit it, you know, perpendicularly to make it move that way. And certain rules like that exist, <clears throat> but doesn't really prove, okay, that it's a clump. <clears throat> just proves that we only receive it as clumps. How did it work? Well, here's a simplistic diagram of the experiment. So here we have a evacuated glass tube. We had a cathode on one side and we have an anode on the other side and we have a big bat. So we just have a piece of metal on one side and a piece of metal on the other side. Um, with, I think they did give it a starting current, frankly. So it's this battery here. Uh, to make it more receptive to the effect. That is to excite the electrons enough without forcing them to jump the gap. And you're really saying, what does it take? What added energy um, causes the um, electrons to leave the surface? Now, whether or not electrons actually do leave the surface is a sort of an open question, in my opinion. Could just be these are, again, a kind of photon. But anyway, continuing battery right here, providing the negative end to the cathode and the positive end to the anode, so there would be an electric field across here. And So there's not a field, there's a potential. 
there's nothing moving across it until you increase the voltage enough to force something to move across it. Then you can say there's a field of whatever stuff is moving. So let's, let's just go, yes, electrons leave the surface. The material falls apart. The electrons start being broken off, and they are received by the anode because it's got its, it's, got its protons showing, so it can receive electrons. Um, but there's no field okay there's just pressure there's just a electrical potential so there's a difference between having a potential and having an actual engaged in making a field by sending the soldiers so you can pile up a bunch of soldiers on you know the shore and then you can blow a whistle and they all leave and start heading inland right um, big difference one state the, the, the stuff isn't moving the other state it is then the experiment would then shine the light on the cathode and of course the energy of the photons in the light which was the, what was presumed then was so again this energy argument it's just about these little bits and they have two qualities one quality is indistinguishable they're all the same they're all moving the same speed and all you can do is have your soldiers line up so so they're really close to each other or really far apart from each other and you can sort of understand that the closer I put them to each other, <clears throat> the more damage they can do to one particular obstacle because they can push on each other and add energy to the, the encounter, um, where if they're far apart, that isn't going to happen. Um, so so it, has, it doesn't have any more energy. It has a circumstance that makes it like it has more energy because it's the right timing. Again, I, I can play with a pendulum and I can poke it, right? And if I poke it when it's leaving, when it's going away from me, I'm adding energy to its system. And if I poke it when it's coming at me, I'm going to degrade its energy. My poke is always the same. It doesn't change any. The only thing that changes is the timing, and the timing is everything, so to speak. And that should be the qualifying argument in here somewhere, is that there's nothing innately different about the photons themselves, the little bits, the quanta. <clears throat> the only way you've added energy is by adding um, a, a cycle time that's critically important, but it isn't actual more energy. We're going to strike the cathode, set electrons free. Remember that electrons can absorb the energy of photons, so it would then set electrons free. Once they're set free from the metal, which is called overcoming the work function. So you're all, all you're really overcoming is the tension. You know, so the like that little hydrogen atom, it's tied. Things are tied to each other. It's in balance. You're disrupting the balance, and you're disrupting it enough to actually break electrons off of the surface so you're <clears throat> you're hitting it um, repeatedly and therefore there's no rebound so you're knocking things you're displacing them much more than if you just casually hit them and allowed them to rebound you're not allowing the rebound you're not allowing it to go back to its neutral condition you keep hitting it so you're hitting it out of its pressure and eventually essentially breaking it. So there's a breaking speed and that's all this is really saying. For a typical metal the work function would be about 2.5 electron volts which means each electron would have to be given 2.5 electron volts worth of energy to jump free from the cathode. So it really just means it needs a certain amount of energy to be broken from its tie to break the rope that's tying it um, and then once it's loose I mean it's obviously can you know, it can't go into more pressure, it's going to go the opposite direction. So obviously if you set up a condition that already exists where there's too many soldiers where you are, you're going to bounce off that high pressure and you're going to go towards the low pressure. But it's not like, all you're doing is breaking it. You're not sending it in a direction. I mean, obviously the momentum would be backwards, right? You're pushing light in, <clears throat> breaking it and then saying it's coming out. Well, it's coming out because of the pressure that you're pushing it into. It's not coming out because obviously the momentum you're adding is in the wrong direction. The pressure you've created on the uh, cathode is what's producing the um, the rebound, the, the, the trampoline. 
and then the electric field will zip the electrons across to the positive anode over here, causing a current to flow. And of course, if you then want to put a current meter in here, I for current meter, you can then uh, notice how much current it was. Well, again, this is sort of a backward, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, I suppose, in the sense that, yes, you're, you can only measure the added, what you've added to the potential of the battery, because you're pushing into the wrong end of the battery, in a sense, sort of. Well, it's the whole plus and minus thing being wrong. Anyway, just ignore that bit. It doesn't really matter. Yes, you can measure at different points in this circuit, but it's likely you have to put a resistor or something else in here to get anything called an accurate reading. It turns out that the amount of energy that each electron requires being 2.5 electron volts, now that we know that photons are quantized, we can then calculate what the energy would have to be for each photon, which of course would be 2.5 electron volts, and which then would be the corresponding wavelength of that photon. So if we say that energy of a photon is H times F, Planck's constant times the frequency. So all this is is basically telling you a minimum. You need a certain um, strength of frequency. Again, the transducers do the same thing. They have the same kind of limit. You won't produce the right vibration in the material unless you get high enough frequency because it only vibrates at certain frequencies. You can't vibrate at the, you know, too low or too high. See, and since the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength, we can solve this for the wavelength. So the wavelength of a photon required to set an electron free from the cathode would have to be a wavelength of 497 nanometers or shorter. Remember, higher energy photons can set electrons free, but anything below the energy required to set, to set an electron free, that electron would not jump free and no current would flow. Now, from the classic point of view, when people didn't believe that photons were quantized chunks of energy, that light was simply a wave, electromagnetic wave. Right, which you will go right back to and argue in all of the other videos, so you don't really take any of this seriously, frankly. Um, and again, I wish it was a stronger proof. Again, all you're really proving is is the fact that you're you're measuring when electrons are moved. You're not really measuring what went in, you're just measuring what came out, and electrons are the byproduct. They're the clumps that you're seeing. And so that's the limiting factor to your vision, is that you can only, you know, it's just, look, you can always say to every one of these um, um, videos, in a sense, the distinction between the fact that there's a bunch of photons we don't see. They're there. A frog can see them. We don't see them. It's just a fact, because it doesn't hit us you know, with enough energy by the tipping point our eyeball has. But a different tipping point can see them. So they're there. And we're pretending, well, what happened to that energy? You know, where's the story of all of those photons we're not seeing? And they're not going to tell that story. The assumption would be that if you shine light on it of wavelengths that are greater than this, therefore less energy per photon, that you still should have a current because the energy would simply accumulate and the electrons would eventually... So again, they're totally ignoring the obvious, which is the frequency is a tipping point thing. I mean, we already... It's since there's so many examples I can give, like the tramp trampoline, right? I mean, if I give the trampoline time to bend back, you know, any kind of rubberized film, if I give it time to, to rebound, Clearly, I'm only going to keep hitting it with my stuff, and it's only going to go in this certain amount, and that's it. But clearly, if I increase the frequency to higher than the rebound speed, if, how fast it can rebound, and I hit it, then I'm going to clearly move the trampoline a lot deeper, and when it comes back, it's going to be a lot more momentum. It's going to be, have a lot more velocity. The electron will have more velocity. And that's exactly what this experiment demonstrates. The, you can change the velocity of the electrons that are leaving by increasing the rate at which you hit it. So if you do use x-rays, you'll get a higher velocity electron. It's, you know, it's right there in front of them. And here he is ignoring entirely and saying, we would think. Well, no, you would think, okay, <laughs> because you're not getting this at all. You're not getting this whole pendulum thing and adding energy versus subtracting energy. 
So, I mean, they're missing something so integral and obvious, and they have it in so much of their other physics. I mean, the whole idea of what waves do in physical mediums is not that dissimilar um, in terms of understanding the fact that the wave ends up with more energy because it's it's defeating the rebound speed of a surface. I mean, I'm using the example of a trampoline. It's right in front of them. I'm using the example of a pendulum. Those things are really obvious and right in front of us. So the fact that they're not getting tipping point, you know, and how you have to wobble something before you can tip it, and all, you know, <laughs> but it's not even occurring them, occurring to them to apply that physics, and that, that's to me the gross evidence of how they just don't give any of this theory any kind of thought. They have no doubt that this mumbo jumbo um, is the truth, and it's the only truth, and they will not look at any other book, you know any other Bible or maybe listen to Darwin. They have no uh, interest. They just have an interest in confirming their fable. And that's it. Accumulate enough energy to, set, to jump free. But it turns out when the light was, for example, a red light with wavelengths much longer than 497 nanometers, no electrons would be set free. None of them would overcome the work function. Right, so it doesn't matter how many times I hit the trampoline slow, Okay, it just isn't going to add up to deeper trampolining. So it's not going to break the trampoline, so to speak. It's not going to bust its whatever membrane. It's not going to do anything. It's just going to keep allowing it to rebound and just going to nothing. Nothing's going to happen. And that if there is a breaking point, the breaking point just means you have to hit three things in a row at a certain speed and then you'll pop a hole in it and no current would be seen whatsoever no matter how strong how intense you made the red light so you keep saying no matter how intense you make it that means no matter how many places you're poking the trampoline at this wrong rate you know it won't make a hole duh i mean duh yeah it won't work no matter how many times i hit the pendulum as it's swinging towards me it won't make the pendulum swing it won't add energy to the system it won't make the pendulum swing all the way around. If I'm swinging a kid on a swing, you know, and I keep pushing it the wrong way, okay, um, not while it's stopped or at its apex, you know, but I push it, you know, when it's coming right at me, clearly the push energy is going to be defeated. And the kid's just going to be sitting in one place a lot. A very strong red light would still not set a single, fo uh, single electron free and no current could be seen. A weak light that had wavelengths smaller than this, 497 nanometers or smaller, like blue light, even if you set it on a very weak setting, so the light was not very intense, a current would be seen. And as you began to crank up the intensity of the light, more and more electrons would be jumping across, more and more electrons would be set. Right, and they'd all be set free at essentially the same voltage, in the sense the same momentum, um, <clears throat> based on the frequency. So increase the frequency. Okay, if you increase the amount of light, you'll increase the number of electrons. You increase the frequency of light, you'll increase how fast they're going to move across the gap. How much voltage they have. At free on the cathode, they would overcome the work function as they absorb the photons, and therefore you'd see a steady current. That experiment, called the photoelectric effect, is what Einstein used to show that photons were indeed quantized chunks of energy. So again, and it really doesn't show that. And, you know, I wish it showed that, but it's like the photo detector or any other instrument. It's, its limitation is the fact that it can't really see the energy. It can only see what tips. And so it has to turn it into a clump because it's a tipping point argument. It's not about what hit, it's about how the, the effect, and that's all you can measure is the effect, and we can only measure the effect based on what tipped over. So it's always gonna look clumpy, because all we see is something fall over, something big fall over. We don't see the actual force that's causing the effect. And so that gives a tremendous insight of what photons are. Yes, uh, again, so he says it gave us a tremendous insight, and all they did with the insight was is to play a game where they say, yes, there's wave-particle duality, <clears throat> but we don't pay any attention to that clump part. 
anyway. We're always going to draw it as a silly wave. We're always going to think of it in the silly terms of it's moving a field of some kind. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're <clears throat> they will never really think about the implications of it being clumps or quantas of energy at a frequency that will not be part of their um, uh, viewpoint in any circumstance. So even when they are overtly describing it, they have they have no respect for it as a fact. And you can just see that in the fact that they're not even thinking about what the implications would be if this was marbles or if these were bowling balls. See, they're very good at doing that when it's to their advantage to use preposterous examples, you know, in the common world. But you don't hear it here anywhere. If these are bowling balls, how could this effect be understood? <laughs> you know. <clears throat> And it's just as simple as, yes, as long as the bowling balls come at a rate that's faster than the rebound speed of the surface, the bowling balls will uh, impede deeper and deeper into the surface. Of course, at this point, we're still not quite sure what they look like, how long are they, how many can you put in a box, so forth. Well, we'll get to that. But yes, you'll still, yes, you will attempt to say you know, even though you just said we don't know. You don't really... Like I said, it's just it's so vague their 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 notions that they can get away with one minute saying exactly the opposite of what they'll say the next minute. At least now we can see that this experiment once and for all proved that the photons were. So again, they called it a proof. It really is a, it's just as shabby as the rest of their proof. So again, even though it's on my side, even though this is something I'd say yes, I wish people could think about photons in this way. Um, I'd like them. Okay, I, uh, I'd feel better if people really paid attention to this. It doesn't prove it. It's not a proof. Okay, it's just an indication. Uh, it's reason to believe. But as I pointed out, one of the flaws in the proof is the fact that we only see when the monuments fall over. We really don't see the bats that are knocking them over. And that's a big problem in terms of saying that we proved it's clumps. They fall in clumps. You know, what knocked them over? That's still unproven by just watching things fall over. Quantized. And that the only way that electrons could be set free is if each electron absorbed one single photon containing the right amount of energy. So again, one single photon. When he says one single photon, that can't happen. Okay, one electron cannot absorb a photon, the entire ray. So that's not happening. The surface is collecting all of the, the effects, and like a trampoline in a sense that if, if they're small, you know, big enough trampolines, they can collect you know, more than one impact, and the impacts can combine to create an effect the effect. Um, it's probably not the best analogy, um, but clearly the surface collects the photon and turns it into momentum in electrons, and the momentum of the electrons ends up being a collection of electrons moving in a direction, and that sort of is an effect on the atoms that are all connected, and then that effect is transmitted to the other surface, and the other surface takes the momentum of the electrons and converts that back into photons. Set free. In other words, a minimum energy equal to the work function or equal and above the work function would set an electron free. So you send 10 photons down with the amount of energy required, 10 electrons would jump free. A thousand photons, a thousand electrons would jump free. But you can send a billion photons down, each of them having not enough energy, wavelengths longer than this, and no electrons would set, be set free because electrons can only absorb the energy within each photon, and if it's not enough, it can't jump free. So, again, it really doesn't have anything to do with that. It just has to do with the more than one electron is moving, and as a collection of electrons that's affecting all of the atoms, and you can almost see how the atoms would, as a collection, would tend to bow their own the electrons moving would tend to okay, be migrated together because you have all these extra protons that are feeling um, deprived of their electrons. 
Um, and so you can almost see how it would take the energy collected, narrow it, you know, transmit it, and then spread it again. But anyway, that's I'm just saying there's mechanical theories for how that transmission takes place. And clearly, I think, clearly, clearly, the photon is gigantic in terms of its spread. Okay, 20 to 2,000 atoms at least, at least. And the electrons are just small parts of the atom. So you, there's no way the photon, the frequency of one photon, is hitting an electron. It's clearly a combined effect, more than one photon in different places in the same space. And all they're doing is saying how many soldiers are hitting the line. Okay, it's not where what platoon they came from, all of that doesn't matter. All it's doing is saying in this piece of space, how many soldiers crossed the line here and at what rate did they cross? And that sends the signal to the other side or that creates the reaction that creates a, a loose electron. It cannot overcome the work function. So that gives us some more insight as to what photons are. Still interested? Keep tuned, and we'll show you some other really neat experiments that were done that give us more and more insight as to what a photon is. I'm afraid it didn't give you any. That's the whole, you know, sadly, <laughs> frankly, didn't uh, stir any, um, you know, your imagination to say, what, is, what are the consequences of this fact? Uh, what can I, how can I understand why there's this limit? And um, I think the simple way to understand it is the only thing you have to overcome is you have to have the right frequency to affect. And you have to have the right frequency because the stuff is in tension and it rebounds. And if you don't hit it faster than the rebound speed, you can't create enough disturbance to break it simply. Uh, yeah. Okay then. Uh, so, I guess till the next time. <laughs> yeah, there's really haven't been any comments worth commenting on, frankly. Um, people and their accusations. You know, some, some guy was defending Pirro and it was, <laughs> it's like, well, defend what he did. Defend the fact that he took an experiment that can't be done the way he did it, right? You put a whole bunch of, of <clears throat> diffracting rays, of waves, into the two-slit experiment. So you take a bunch of waves that are, are already interfering with each other. We're already reflecting off the surfaces, creating all kinds of noise. And you throw that through the two-slit experiment, and that's going to be an honest experiment that shows integrity. I mean, it's just amazing what people will defend. Uh, you know, in a slanderous way. Um, you know, Pirro says I have lied about something. What's, where's the lie? Pirro says I have some conspiracy against science. Well, where's the example of it? <laughs> you know, no. It just, you, you, you're really just so disgraceful, humans. So that's my Christmas message. Humans suck. <laughs> you know, we just plain suck. They don't deserve a Christmas. No presents. Didn't earn them. Uh, frankly. Alright, so that's enough. So till the next time and such. Yeah, I think that's it.